Sketches by Boz, Section 21. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Sketches by Boz by Charles Dickens, Section 21. Scenes, Chapter 14. Vauxhall Gardens by Day. There was a time when, if a man ventured to wonder how Vauxhall Gardens would look by day, he was hailed with a shout of derision at the absurdity of the idea. Vauxhall by daylight! A porter pot without porter, the House of Commons without the Speaker, a gas lamp without the gas! Pooh! Nonsense! The thing was not to be thought of. It was rumoured, too, in those times, that Vauxhall Gardens by day were the scene of secret and hidden experiments, that there carvers were exercised in the mystic art of cutting a moderate-sized ham into slices thin enough to pave the whole of the grounds, that beneath the shade of the tall trees studious men were constantly engaged in chemical experiments with the view of discovering how much water a bowl of negus could possibly bear and that in some retired nooks appropriated to the study of ornithology other sage and learned men were by a process known only to themselves incessantly employed in reducing fowls to a mere combination of skin and bone vague rumours of this kind together with many others of a similar nature cast over vauxhall gardens an air of deep mystery and as there is a great deal in the mysterious there is no doubt that to a good many people at all events the pleasure they afforded was not a little enhanced by this very circumstance we loved to wander among those illuminated groves thinking of the patient and laborious researches which had been carried on there during the day and witnessing their results in the suppers which were served up beneath the light of lamps and the sound of music at night the temples and saloons and cosmoramas and fountains glittered and sparkled before our eyes the beauty of the lady singers and the elegant deportment of the gentlemen captivated our hearts a few hundred thousand of additional lamps dazzled our senses a bowl or two of punch bewildered our brains and we were happy in an evil hour the proprietors of vauxhill gardens took to opening them by day we regretted this as rudely and harshly disturbing that veil of mystery which had hung about the property for many years and which none but the noonday sun and the late mr simpson had ever penetrated we shrunk from going at this moment we scarcely know why perhaps a morbid consciousness of approaching disappointment perhaps a fatal presentiment perhaps the weather whatever it was we did not go until the second or third announcement of a race between two balloons tempted us and we went we paid our shilling at the gate and then we saw for the first time that the entrance if there had been any magic about it at all was now decidedly disenchanted being in fact nothing more nor less than a combination of very roughly painted boards and sawdust we glanced at the orchestra and supper-room as we hurried past we just recognized them and that was all we bent our steps to the firework ground there at least we should not be disappointed we reached it and stood rooted to the spot with mortification and astonishment that the moorish tower the wooden shed with a door in the centre and daubs of crimson and yellow all around like a gigantic watch-case that the place where night after night we had beheld the undaunted mr blackmore make his terrific ascent surrounded by flames of fire and peals of artillery and where the white garments of madame somebody we forgot even her name now who nobly devoted her life to the manufacture of fireworks had so often been seen fluttering in the wind as she called up a red blue or party-coloured light to illuminate her temple that the but at this moment the bell rung the people scampered away pell-mell to the spot from whence the sound proceeded and we from the mere force of habit found ourselves running among the first as if for very life it was for the concert in the orchestra a small party of dismal men in cocked hats were executing the overture to tancredi and a numerous assemblage of ladies and gentlemen with their families had rushed from their half-emptied stout mugs in the supper-boxes and crowded to the spot intense was the low murmur of admiration when a particularly small gentleman in a dress-coat led on a particularly tall lady in a blue sarcenet pelisse and bonnet of the same ornamented with large white feathers and forthwith commenced a plaintive duet 
We knew the small gentleman well. We had seen a lithographed semblance of him on many a piece of music, with his mouth wide open as if in the act of singing, a wine-glass in his hand, and a table with two decanters and four pineapples on it in the background. The tall lady, too, we had gazed on, lost in raptures of admiration many and many a time. How different people do look by daylight, and without punch, to be sure! It was a beautiful duet. First the small gentleman asked a question, and then the tall lady answered it. Then the small gentleman and the tall lady sang together most melodiously. Then the small gentleman went through a little piece of vehemence by himself, and got very tenor indeed in the excitement of his feelings, to which the tall lady responded in a similar manner. Then the small gentleman had a shake or two, after which the tall lady had the same, and then they both merged imperceptibly into the original air, and the band wound themselves up to a pitch of fury, and the small gentleman handed the tall lady out, and the applause was rapturous. The comic singer, however, was the especial favourite. We really thought that a gentleman, with his dinner in a pocket-handkerchief who stood near us, would have fainted with excess of joy. A marvellously facetious gentleman that comic singer is. His distinguishing characteristics are a wig approaching to the flaxen, and an aged countenance, and he bears the name of one of the English counties, if we recollect right. He sang a very good song about the seven ages, the first half-hour of which afforded the assembly the purest delight. Of the rest we can make no report, as we did not stay to hear any more. We walked about, and met with a disappointment at every turn. Our favourite views were mere patches of paint. The fountain that had sparkled so showily by lamplight presented very much the appearance of a water-pipe that had burst. All the ornaments were dingy, and the walks gloomy. There was a spectral attempt at rope-dancing in the little open theatre. The sun shone upon the spangled dresses of the performers, and their evolutions were about as inspiriting and appropriate as a country dance in a family vault. So we retraced our steps to the firework ground, and mingled with the little crowd of people who were contemplating Mr. Green. Some half-dozen men were restraining the impetuosity of one of the balloons, which was completely filled, and had the car already attached, and, as rumours had gone abroad that a lord was going up, the crowd was more than usually anxious and talkative. There was one little man, in faded black, with a dirty face and a rusty black neckerchief with a red border, tied in a narrow wisp round his neck, who entered into conversation with everybody, and had something to say upon every remark that was made within his hearing. He was standing with his arms folded, staring up at the balloon, and every now and then vented his feelings of reverence for the aeronaut, by saying, as he looked round to catch somebody's eye, "'He's a rum on his green. Think o' this here being upwards of his two hundredth ascent. He called the man as is equal to green, never had the toothache yet, nor won't have within this hundred years and that's all about it. When you meets with real talent and native too to encourage it, that's what I say. And when he had delivered himself to this effect, he would fold his arms with more determination than ever, and stare at the balloon with a sort of admiring defiance of any other man alive, beyond himself and green, that impressed the crowd with the opinion that he was an oracle. Ah! "'You're very right, sir,' said another gentleman, with his wife and children and mother and wife's sister, and a host of female friends, in all the gentility of white pocket handkerchiefs, frills, and spencers. "'Mr. Green is a steady hand, sir, and there's no fear about him.' "'Fear,' said the little man, "'isn't it a lovely thing to see him and his wife a goin' up in one balloon, and his own son and his wife a jostlin' up against them in another, and all of them going twenty or thirty mile in three hour or so, and then coming back in purchases? I don't know where this here science is to stop, mind you. That's what bothers me.' Here there was a considerable talking among the females in the Spencers. "'What's the ladies a-laughing at, sir?' inquired the little man condescendingly. "'It's only my sister Mary,' said one of the girls, "'as says she hopes his lordship won't be frightened when he's in the car and want to come out again.' 
"'Make yourself easy about that there, my dear,' replied the little man. "'If he was so much as to move an inch without leave, Green would just fetch him a crack over the head with a telescope, as would send him into the bottom of the basket in no time, and stun him till they come down again.' "'Would he, though?' inquired the other man. "'Yes, would he,' replied the little one. "'And think nothing of it neither, if he was the king himself. Green's presence of mind is wonderful.' Just at this moment all eyes were directed to the preparations which were being made for starting. The car was attached to the second balloon, the two were brought pretty close together, and a military band commenced playing with a zeal and fervour which would render the most timid man in existence but too happy to accept any means of quitting that particular spot on earth on which they were stationed. Then Mr. Green, Sr., and his noble companion entered one car, and Mr. Green, Jr., and his companion the other, and then the balloons went up, and the aerial travellers stood up, and the crowd outside roared with delight, and the two gentlemen who had never ascended before tried to wave their flags as if they were not nervous but held on very fast all the while and the balloons were wafted gently away our little friend solemnly protesting long after they were reduced to mere specks in the air that he could still distinguish the white hat of mr green the gardens disgorged their multitudes boys ran up and down screaming balloon and in all the crowded thoroughfares people rushed out of their shops into the middle of the road and having stared up in the air at two little black objects till they almost dislocated their necks walked slowly in again perfectly satisfied the next day there was a grand account of the ascent in the morning papers and the public were informed how it was the finest day but four in mr green's remembrance how they retained sight of the earth till they lost it behind the clouds and how the reflection of the balloon on the undulating masses of vapour was gorgeously picturesque together with a little science about the refraction of the sun's rays and some mysterious hints respecting atmospheric heat and eddying currents of air and there was also an interesting account of how a man in a boat was distinctly heard by mr green jr to exclaim my eye which Mr. Green, Jr., attributed to his voice rising to the balloon, and the sound being thrown back from its surface into the car, and the whole concluded with a slight allusion to another ascent next Wednesday, all of which was very instructive and very amusing, as our readers will see if they look to the papers. If we have forgotten to mention the date, they have only to wait till next summer, and take the account of the first ascent, and it will answer the purpose equally well. End of section 21